Welcome to Your Child's Brain, a podcast series produced by Kennedy Krieger Institute with assistance from WYPR. I'm Dr. Brad Schlager, pediatric neurologist and president and CEO of Kennedy Krieger Institute. Sickle cell disease refers to a group of inherited disorders of red blood cells that affects roughly 100,000 people in the United States alone. While the risk for sickle cell disease is greatest in people of African descent, about one in 365 black Americans have sickle cell disease. The disease crosses racial and ethnic boundaries and affects males and females in equal numbers. Sickle cell is a genetic disorder. People with sickle cell disease have inherited copies of genes from both parents, thus it's an autosomal recessive disorder. The genetic mutation directly affects the hemoglobin, the oxygen carrying molecule in our red blood cells. Under the microscope, affected red blood cells take on a crescent or sickle shape, thus the name. These affected red blood cells do not do a good job of carrying oxygen to the body's organs, like the lungs, liver, kidneys, muscles, and so forth, and that includes the brain. So today, our focus will be on an aspect of sickle cell disease that doesn't get as much attention as it deserves, the neurological and developmental implications that include strokes, seizures, and neurodevelopmental issues such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, specific learning disabilities, language issues, and executive dysfunctions. These conditions may severely impact children's functional independence, mental health, quality of life, and educational pursuits, and may increase their risk of future complications. So today I'm joined by one of my extraordinary colleagues at Kennedy Krieger, Dr. Ebony Lance. Dr. Lance is the medical director of Kennedy Krieger's Sickle Cell Neurodevelopmental Clinic, She's the co-director of the Institute's Neurology and Neurogenetics Clinic. Dr. Lance is an associate professor of neurology and pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. We are also quite fortunate to welcome Derek and Shante Robertson. The Robertsons, parents of children with sickle cell disease, are the founders and directors of the Maryland Sickle Cell Disease Association, an organization that was created to improve the lives of Marylanders with sickle cell disease. So welcome, Ebony. Derek and Shantae. And Ebony, let's start with you. Some definitions. What is sickle cell disease? We touched on it briefly at the beginning, but what is it and what causes it? So sickle cell disease is an inherited disorder of red blood cells. Uh, It's caused by a genetic mutation in the hemoglobin molecule, uh, which leads to these red blood cells having both a shortened lifespan, as well as difficulties with changing shapes. So a lot of times the red blood cells can get stuck in the sickled shape and then they get stuck in various blood vessels and that can lead to a lot of the complications that we see associated with sickle cell disease. And so how common is it? I mentioned some aspect of the prevalence, but can you expound on that? Sure. Uh, It's important to think of sickle cell disease as a global disorder because it affects millions of people worldwide and that can Uh, particularly be true in different areas of the world, including Central and South America, the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Mediterranean, uh, Saudi Arabia, and India in particular. And it primarily impacts people of color uh, in this country. And how does it show up? What are the symptoms uh, that typically present for, for sickle cell disease? One of the most common symptoms in sickle cell disease, pretty much the hallmark in terms of what people know about it, is uh, vaso-occlusive or pain crises. And these pain crises can occur in any part of the body uh, and are associated with that sickling feature of the red blood cells, where again, they get stuck in these various positions. uh, And sometimes that leads to blockages in various arteries or veins, uh, blood vessels. And then that can lead to difficulties with the blood flow getting through and lead to pain. And these pain crises can be fairly severe uh, and cause these patients to then have to go to the hospital uh, and receive treatment from strong medications. A lot of patients have at least one uh, sickle cell pain crisis a year. Uh, Some have more, some have less. But that's really one of the major complications associated with this disease. There are other complications as well. One of the common causes of uh, death in sickle cell disease is when you have a sickling crisis involving the lungs, uh, something called acute chest syndrome. And so that's something uh, that can be fairly severe. Obviously, it can impact your ability to breathe. A lot of times patients will have to go to the hospital and be hospitalized in an ICU setting in order to treat that. 
And then in addition to those uh, crises, there are several other complications associated with sickle cell disease that can affect the entire body. And those can uh, range from stroke, uh, seizures, headaches, to things that affect your learning uh, and your behavior, as well as uh, that can impact your ability to walk, uh, like avascular necrosis of the hips or bone crises. So you really just describe a variety of types of symptoms and signs for sickle cell disease. Can you speak now to the variability? Are, are there patients who have mild, moderate, and severe forms? Of course, you mentioned that it can be fatal as well. So there, there must be a severe end of the spectrum. But how variable is it? And is there a way to predict who's going to have a mild course? Uh, yes. So sickle cell disease can be very variable. Uh, it depends on the patient. And it's very important to always... Uh, listen to the patient in terms of describing their disease and how severe uh, they feel it is. There are different subtypes of sickle cell disease, uh, but again, uh, it's difficult to predict who is going to have a more severe uh, course versus who has a milder course. There are plenty of patients uh, with sickle cell disease who almost never come to the hospital, who are seen by their doctors maybe once a year just to check in, uh, but really do quite well. And then there are other patients uh, that are frequent visitors to the hospital or urgent care centers, uh, frequently need medical attention and treatment, and have to be seen several times a year uh, and receive disease-modifying treatments and other therapies uh, to help with their care. It's very difficult to predict. In general, people say that uh, one of the more common subtypes of sickle cell disease, uh, homozygous SS type sickle cell disease, is usually more severe. But there are other subtypes of sickle cell disease uh, that can have just as severe manifestations. So again, it's important to focus on the individual, the patient, and their description of their disease. You know, it's been nearly 50 years since New York started the first newborn screening program for sickle cell disease. That was 1975. In 1987, the National Institutes of Health came up with a consensus panel that recommended newborn screening for children. But it wasn't until nearly 20 years later, in 2006, that newborn screening for sickle cell disease became available in all 50 U.S. states. So can you speak to that newborn screening story and, and what has been the impact of screening in the newborn period for the diagnosis and treatment for sickle cell disease? With the introduction of the newborn screening, uh, it really meant that for the first time we could know from birth uh, if a child had sickle cell disease or not. And that's important because these patients are also predisposed to different infections. And infection was actually a very common cause of mortality in these patients uh, before the newborn screening days. And so a lot of patients uh, would actually die as children uh, from these infections that would, uh, would attack their entire body, in large part because uh, the body was no longer protected by the spleen. And so uh, the spleen uh, usually collects uh, red blood cells, kind of cleans our blood supply. And in patients with sickle cell disease, the spleen very quickly, very early in life, can get clogged by these sickled red blood cells. And so once the spleen isn't functional, uh, the body is predisposed to infection from encapsulated organisms or these very specific bugs uh, that can make you very, very sick. And in children, uh, can be very quickly fatal. So introducing sickle cell disease into the newborn screen allowed these patients from birth to be started on penicillin or other antibiotics, which they take on a daily basis in order to protect them from these infections. And so it's led to a lot more patients surviving into adulthood, patients having a longer lifespan, uh, and we've had to grow and learn more about the disease and how it affects not just children, uh, but young adults and adults, as well as geriatric adults, as time has gone by. So Derek and Shante, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, can you tell us about your children, what their journey has been like and, and how they were diagnosed? Derek and I have three sons. Uh, two of whom live with sickle cell disease. Our oldest son is not affected by the disease and um, has always been a great support system for his brothers um, throughout 
the span of their having to manage their disease. Our two sons who have sickle cell disease are young men now, and they're both, uh, you know, college students uh, preparing for life. Great guys. I, I'm, I'm very proud of, of, of our sons and uh, their experience or their journey living with sickle cell disease has been very interesting because the our two sons who do live with sickle cell disease have had both quite a different journey. Um, our middle son, who was our first child born with sickle cell disease, has had a milder case as far as pain and uh, some of the complications that individuals living with sickle cell disease have to um, deal with. He's had less of that. Um, our youngest has unfortunately had quite a few um bouts with with pain and hospitalizations and um, you know fortunately when he was introduced to hydroxyurea which is a very important um, treatment for individuals living with sickle cell disease uh, that turned things around for him and um, has made managing sickle cell disease a lot a lot better for him but um, it's just been a wonderful experience being the mother of my sons and just being here to support the healthiest path for them while managing sickle cell disease. Did you have much experience with or, or understanding of sickle cell disease prior to learning of, of your son's diagnoses and, and then going on the, the journey that you're on now? You had actually asked how the children were diagnosed and, and what Ebony spoke about with um, newborn screening. That was instrumental for us. So when our sons were born, newborn screening, and they were born in two different states. Our middle son was born in Texas, and our youngest was born in Maryland. And so in both instances, our diagnosis came from the newborn screening program. So they were diagnosed pretty early. It, it kind of ties into the question about the experience we had. So clearly with the second child, we had you know more of an expectation um, or that, that this was possible. I have a family history of sickle cell disease. So I had a brother. Um, I grew up in Jamaica and I had a brother who had sickle cell disease and he passed away at 18. And so certainly was familiar with sickle cell disease. Um, and I knew I had sickle cell trait. Everybody mentioned the different types. And I think you mentioned at the intro the different types of um, uh, sickle cell and everybody mentioned SS. So SS would be where one pair, both parents have sickle cell trait, the S gene, and they come together. Well, I have the sickle cell trait. Shante has thalassemia minor, the thalassemia trait. What we didn't know, and, and I remember clearly as well, that when you put sickle cell trait with thalassemia, you can still, you still have sickle cell disease. So our, both our sons have sickle beta thalassemia. And then leave it up to the docs like Ebony to make it even more complicated that there are two types of sickle beta thalassemia that we learned. There's sickle thalassemia plus and there's sickle beta thalassemia zero. Zero tends to be more severe. Our boys have sickle beta thal plus. But as Dr. Lance Ebony said earlier, and Shanti mentioned, the courses have been very different. But what's interesting, just to point out, is that a lot of times, Shanti and I say, our middle son has had a different outward course. Because as parents with sickle cell, sometimes we don't know what's going on on the inside. Yes, so my experience with sickle sickle cell, I remember growing up um, having a classmate who did not, um, who missed a lot of school. And um, I remember asking once, you know, what's going on? Is he sick? And someone mentioned, oh, he has something called sickle cell disease. And that just kind of stayed in my head on the backdrop of my mind. Fast forward many, many, many years later, um, because this was in elementary school, uh, to then have a child. And then when, when I met Derek, we knew um, he had a brother um, who had sickle cell disease, who unfortunately passed away uh, in his uh, early adult years. So that's when sickle cell kind of came back up again in my head. But as Derek mentioned, neither of us never thinking that the trait that he had and the thalassemia, uh, sickle cell trait that he had, the thalassemia trait that I had would then produce a form of sickle cell disease. We just, neither one of us, that never was even a consideration. So um, I didn't have the personal family history um, as Derek did with his brother living with the disease. But I do remember that classmate quite clearly and um, missing a lot of school. And, and, and that, did, that did really played a role in 
once we found out that our middle son had sickle cell disease, it really played a role in my wanting to learn as much as I could. I, I really didn't want uh, my our child's experience to be what I perceived my classmates' experience, which missing a lot of school, missing a lot of time with friends. I really didn't want that to be the life for our child. I think it's clear for us at least, we don't know if our reproductive decisions would have been any different. You know, and I think absolutely not. Point yes. out, right. Uh, because sometimes, and we might talk about this later, but there, there's sometimes, it is, I think what we really promote is what we call informed decision and reproductive decision making. So, you know, so it's much better from our personal experience to know what can be, um, but not that we would have necessarily made any different reproductive decisions. The point about missing a lot of school in the context of a chronic illness, that that is a a reality that can have implications for neurodevelopmental outcomes directly. But in addition, as we've talked about earlier on, sickle cell disease also has an effect directly on the brain. So, Ebony, your work has focused on the neurodevelopmental aspects of sickle cell disease. Can you tell us about the, the direct effects of sickle cell disease on brain function we're going to get to talking about education down the road. So sickle cell disease can affect the brain in a few different ways. Uh, The way that most people know about is through brain injury. And so uh, people with sickle cell disease have an increased risk for having stroke or having silent strokes, uh, which can affect the brain and its function. And so we have different things that we do to try to assess their risk for stroke, uh, like transcranial Dopplers, Uh, which certain patients with sickle cell disease get every year uh, between the ages of 2 and 16. And that's a a way to look at blood flow to the brain, basically. Yes, that's an ultrasound uh, where they look at uh, the speed of blood flow in the uh, vessels in the brain uh, and predict who is at highest risk for stroke. And so uh, these children will get uh, those ultrasounds and will be able to know who's at high risk the patients at highest risk oftentimes go on transfusion therapy where they get transfusions every uh, four to six weeks and that decreases the speed of that blood flow and decreases their risk for stroke. Unfortunately, uh, transcranial Dopplers do not uh, work to predict risk for silent stroke. And so there is a lot of research going on about silent stroke currently and how that impacts the brain because silent stroke usually involves smaller blood vessels in the brain. And the idea with silent stroke is that, that there's evidence on a brain image, say, that some brain injury took place due to a vas- vessel that was occluded, but clinically there was no obvious event like uh, you typically think of with stroke per se. Yes, exactly. There were no uh, hallmark symptoms that we typically associate with stroke. So no weakness of one side of the body, uh, no difficulties with speech, no trouble with one side of the face. However, there are more insidious Uh, or less obvious manifestations of silent stroke, depending on what area of the brain is impacted. Uh, So it's important to know that that is also something that people living with sickle cell disease are at increased risk for. And then in addition to brain injury, uh, sickle cell disease also causes anemia. I mentioned earlier that shortened life of those red blood cells. And so anemia can also impact the brain, in particular the developing brain. And so there's an impact of anemia on um, the brain of children and adults with sickle cell disease. And we think that that's also impacting uh, their learning, their behavior. And so that is something that we are also studying and trying to understand more while at the same time trying to advocate for treatment of anemia. Your clinic is unique. It it focuses on neurodevelopmental issues in sickle cell. It's, It's unique to Maryland. Are there other such clinics around? And, and then in terms of the, the way you uh, operate that clinic, how do you evaluate a child's status and needs? As far as I know, uh, we are the only clinic, a standalone clinic for children and adults with sickle cell disease and neurodevelopmental issues. Uh, there have been other clinics in the past, um, uh, but I do not think that they are currently active. A lot of hematology centers uh, and sickle cell disease centers actually have neuropsychologists or behavioral psychologists uh, or neurodevelopmental physicians in their sickle cell clinics who see patients. But again, we stand alone uh, and we accept patients uh, from multiple centers. 
So we have referrals from Johns Hopkins primarily, but also see patients from Sinai Hospital, from INOVA, uh, from University of Maryland, really from uh, various hospitals in the Maryland, DC and Virginia area. And the way that we evaluate uh, patients in our comprehensive clinic is we really try to use an interdisciplinary approach. So I see all of the patients, and again, my training is in neurology and developmental medicine. Uh, so I try to see patients with that lens on. We have a neuropsychologist who does a lot of uh, IQ testing as well as academic testing in these patients. So really trying to look at what their strengths and weaknesses are in terms of their abilities to learn. We have a behavioral therapist who talks to these patients about having a chronic disease, what coping strategies they can use uh, to deal with that, and what other strategies they can use to help with, uh, for example, missing school, to help with things that are very common in sickle cell disease, uh, things like bedwetting uh, or nocturnal enuresis can be quite common. And then other things like pica or eating non-food items is something else that's very common. And so our behavioral therapist really targets those things. And in addition to that, uh, again, we have that interdisciplinary uh, connection. And so we all talk to each other about these patients. We also have an educational specialist in our clinic who actually works with families to create school education plans and set up IEPs and 504 plans with the school and we have an adult neurodevelopmental provider as well as a child psychiatrist in our group. So let, let's talk a bit about the educational part of, the, of what you just described. So the individualized education programs are children with sickle cell disease are eligible for such IEPs. And what, what are the typical kinds of accommodations that might be needed to be made at school for children with sickle cell? Uh, yes, these children are definitely eligible for IEPs and there are a lot of different accommodations available to them. From a purely medical standpoint, it's important uh, that their hematologist weighs in on what needs they may have. A lot of cases, there are a lot of cases uh, where these patients need to be shielded from extreme temperatures. Uh, so maybe they uh, don't go outside in the winter because that could precipitate a pain crisis. Uh, or maybe in extreme heat, they also uh, don't go outside. It's important that they get frequent water breaks because uh, dehydration can precipitate different complications associated with sickle cell disease. In addition, they will need frequent bathroom breaks as well um, because they really do need to maintain their hydration. And then in addition to that, it's important to educate the school personnel and the school nurse about when an emergency might be occurring and when they may need to go to the hospital. And so I believe that uh, Derek and Shantae may have more to add on what Maryland specifically has done for children with sickle cell disease in terms of school programs. That's a great segue because I, I wanted to ask you both, Derek and Shante, what, what, what were your experiences at school? What were the kinds of challenges that you saw? And perhaps talk about the, including the experience with, if you went down that path, with individualized education programs as well. One of the important challenges for us, and I believe for many other parents, is having the information. So we did not know what was open to us when we just started. It was actually another parent who mentioned to us about um, a 504 plan and IEPs. Um, and I think at the time our children were in like second and third grade. Um, and so one of the things as well, one of the accommodations which became important for, for our children was um, having extra time to finish assignments, um, which was linked to, to the work that we were doing with Ebony. And I think it's important that to understand the dis and, and for parents to understand the difference between the 504 and the IEP, you know, because sometimes folks will think that their children are doing great in school or they get all A's, you know, they're getting A's and B's. And so they don't need an IEP because sometimes IEPs are associated more with children who are perceived to have intellectual disabilities or they're getting, they're struggling. And as was explained to us, IEPs can actually change a curriculum, right? It, it can, so instead of having to do three tests, you do one or something like that. But the 504 plan doesn't necessarily change a curriculum, but it can change the accommodations for your child. And that was where we really looked at because one of the things in terms of you know having to come back to school for example with after a crisis 
having to have a a pillow that you can sit on because you had a pain in your back, um, wearing a hat in class because your head might be cold, um, sitting closer to the front because, you know, the attention may not be there. You know, all of those things are in the 504 plan. And very early on, as Shante mentioned before, I think her emphasis was the experience for our children and, and really all children that we thought of that were going through this in school. And I'll let Shanti talk a little bit about um, the work she did and really spearheaded with the school nurses. And then I'll talk a little bit about the advocacy we did on the state level that affects you know everybody in Maryland. Yes, so I, I can't stress enough how important it is to have a relationship with your school nurse nursing team, whether that be a uh, nurse's aide who's there five days a week and a school nurse who comes in once a week. It's a, that that relationship is is really critical. Um, they become your your advocate uh, in school for your child. Derek and I have always had a very strong relationship to this day. I could see our son's elementary school nurse and we could still speak and say hello and recognize each other and have an appreciation for each other just because that relationship was built um, and recognizing the importance of that nurse or nurse's aide being the voice for your child when there's a substitute teacher in the classroom or even just um, educating and being in communication with the faculty there at the school and um, having a really clear understanding of what it means to successfully manage this disease in the school setting. So I can't stress that enough. What we did um, to build up to getting the legislation that children living with sickle cell disease, uh, K through 12 in Maryland, which Derek is gonna talk about, is we really partnered with our school um, faculty and everyone, we got everyone involved. We went in and asked the administration if we could in service the staff and basically everyone who had any type of interaction with our children in the school, um, whether that be the lunchroom attendance, the playground attendance, whoever had some type of interaction with children in the school, with our children in the school, we wanted them to know about sickle cell disease and be free to ask questions. And so we were fortunate enough to have a good relationship, an excellent relationship with the pediatric nurses at Hopkins. And we had a nurse who would come out to the school um, at every level, elementary, middle, and high school, and just talk to the staff about sickle cell disease and how that looks in the school setting and what are some of the important things to consider and to be aware of. That was really, I think, the biggest thing that we did in the school is just to provide that education. One anecdote um, that that advocacy led to was um, one of the more serious crises that our, our youngest son had was actually identified early by a recess monitor who just saw him looking a little bit more fatigued and was able to call the nurse and they called us and um, he ended up being in hospital for almost a week, but it could have been a lot worse. We actually brought together the the state school nurses. So we had, we got on their agenda, uh, Shante got on their, the school nurses association for the statewide. What we did on the statewide level, we had thankfully, and I can't say this without mentioning her, um, a state senator, um, Senator Shirley Nathan Pulliam, who's now retired. And she approached us and said, hey, do you know that there are guidelines um, for asthma in school and there are guidelines for, di for juvenile diabetes in the schools? Why don't we have something for sickle cell disease? And that was really the impetus. So she helped us craft some legislation um, and that legislation passed, which in essence says that if you're K through 12 and you identify with sickle cell disease, the school has to put in um, a school management plan for your for the child. Essentially, it's an individualized health plan. We talked about the 504, but this is an individualized health plan that outlines all the different steps that they need to take. And these guidelines were written with you know Dr. Lance's help um, and are now posted on the, the both the Department of Education and the Department of Health um, websites. Um, and the nurses have actually gone through um, training. It's training that they go through during the summer when the kids are off and they're doing their, their professional education. That's part of the training going into this every school year. And one of the things I think we learned from folks like Ebony was that 
the teachers can play a real integral part in identifying um, that change in behavior. So a child that was getting A's and B's and is suddenly getting C's and D's or struggling a little bit, and there's some change. You talk about those insidious changes. The school system is so important right, because they see them more than we do. You know, when they're in that, that school age, you know, they're between going to child care and then you go to school and then you have aftercare because many of us have to work and you're picking up your kids at five o'clock. You know, they can see that. And so that was why we thought it was just so important um, to have them identify some of the things to look out for, um, you know, in, in children with, with sickle cell disease. And so that legislation is in, in effect. It was in effect since 2019. It was actually being implemented when COVID hit in the spring of 2020. Um, and it's, but it's still there. And, and we feel very um, proud of that legislation. And, and we think it's going to make a big difference, you know, for children in the it's, re- it's really consequential legislation. And um, uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you for championing it. And Ebony, for your work in, in bringing it to fruition. Consequential because it affects so many lives. Your point about school, too. You're talking to a couple of child neurologists here with, with, with me and Ebony. We both know that the real action for cognitive development is happening in the school, not by coming to see us a couple times a year, but being in school, having the opportunity to, to learn and develop. So every effort to make sure that happens and happens effectively and safely is a, a, the highest priority. Ebony, let's, let's talk about, you, you mentioned uh, some of the research that's going on. And I think Shante mentioned hydroxyurea. There, there are other treatments out there that have effectiveness for sickle cell. Where are we on the treatment front? And is there a cure? For years, it had primarily been uh, hydroxyurea and transfusion therapy for sickle cell disease. Uh, but in the last uh, decade or so, there have been a lot of new treatments uh, for sickle cell disease uh, that have been popping up. These are disease-modifying therapies primarily, uh, not necessarily curative therapies, uh, but these are things that can improve uh, the lives of patients with sickle cell disease. Uh, And so there are a lot of new treatments that are out there that are being used uh, to support these patients. And there are curative treatments as well. Uh, One of the original ones is bone marrow transplants, which can be used in a subset of the population, but there's a lot of research going on to try to expand who can receive bone marrow transplants and to try to make uh, the regimen for receiving a bone marrow transplant a little bit easier to endure, to withstand, uh, so that more people uh, can have this curative treatment. In addition to that, there are a few genetic therapies uh, that are being developed uh, that can also be curative for sickle cell disease. And so that's something that's very exciting Uh, that's being championed by a lot of people. And so there are new therapies coming down the pipeline as we speak. You know, when our son was in the hospital, um, you really feel helpless because you're really just talking about pain management at the time. You know, are you going to increase the morphine or lower the morphine? And it was, it's not easy as parents, not easy for the child to go through it, but it's not easy to see your child in pain and not being able to do anything about it. And so it's a hopeful time um, for sickle cell disease. I I think one of the things that we're really, you know, cure is a very big word. Um, And I think how we look at it and define it. So for example, some of the gene, one of the gene therapies that Dr. Lance mentioned is looking to increase the fetal hemoglobin, which is what hydroxyurea does. So I think the studies have shown that if you can increase the, the hemoglobin that you get from your mom, and this is a layperson's interpretation, it provides protection for children with sickle cell disease for some time. But then we naturally lose that fetal hemoglobin as we come into adulthood. Hydroxyurea raises that fetal hemoglobin. And one of the gene therapies is really, I mean, they're trying to turn off the gene that stops the production of fetal hemoglobin. One could, I say, is that a cure per se, but I don't know if that's what the goal is. The goal is really to make sure that you're not symptomatic. So if you can get the fetal hemoglobin up to a level that 
um, you're not symptomatic and you're not having the child, you're probably living more like somebody who has sickle cell trait. So I think that that's, as we talk about cure for many disorders, I think, you know, we have to really look and say, what does that really mean? Um, and for us, not everybody is going to um, be eligible for these quote unquote cures, right? Because you have to have this delicate balance between somebody who is sick enough and somebody who can get it. So like our children may not be eligible for that because Dr. Lance mentioned the conditioning that you have to go through. You have to go, you know, you have to wipe out your red blood cells. It's, it's chemotherapy and ethically um, physicians may say, I don't want to put you through that because your life is just not, at that you know level that you want to do that, so we have to really work on making sure that conditioning is is more palatable for everybody. So for us and many many others with sickle cell disease, the disease modifying therapies are what I think can make a huge difference. Um, and I think of other disease states that have therapies. Even HIV, I think, is a really good example. Um, in the early days, that was really a fatal disease. Now people are looking at HIV more as a chronic illness, um, and you can get, you know, and so that's where we are really hoping that as these therapies come out, that will increase hemoglobin levels, that will reduce the number of pain crises. Um, we're very hopeful for that. Can Can you, uh, you Derek or, or Shante, uh, just take a minute to tell us a little bit about the the origins of the Maryland Sickle Cell Disease Association? Because we'd like also to be able to put a link to the organization on the web page for, for this episode, just but perhaps a little bit of a, a background on wh- where the uh, the notion of the association came from. So I think it it was really we want it started out just as an idea that we wanted to be able to link. We saw very early on that there was a link between the hematologist our primary care physician and emergency room, where we knew that that was, you know, unfortunately we spent a lot, spent a lot of time in the emergency room. And so we put on a, um, a forum and the attendance was just really great. And I think we both had backgrounds in patient advocacy. I worked and still work for several years in hemophilia. And I saw firsthand how patient advocacy in that disease state through chapters made a huge difference. Shante was working in the pharmaceutical sales industry, and she saw from that perspective the, the, the importance of patient advocacy. And I think that that's what really gave rise to say, you know, we really wanted to advocate for not just our children, um, but really just looking at the community and seeing that we could make a difference with the patient voice. And, and that's I think was the, the, the main impetus for the Maryland Sickle Cell Disease Association. I think also, um, in addition to all those things that Derek mentioned, uh, we also saw a need to have a voice for the community and also helping the community to understand what's out there, to be educated on. Uh, and we just finished talking about a lot of great new modifying therapies and potentially curative therapies on the horizon. Well, in order for those therapies to be of use, you have to have a community that that will accept those therapies. And that community needs to be educated. And that really is a really big role of, of community-based organizations, I feel, to educate the community, not to uh, push a decision one way or the other, but just to make sure the community has all of the necessary information to make the most informed decision about those therapies. So that was another um, driving reason for having our organization was really to make sure the sickle cell community is very well informed and educated. Ebony, I'm going to end with this question for you. You mentioned a little bit about research. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you're doing right now and opportunities for people listening in to potentially participate? Sure. Uh, So we have several research studies ongoing at this time in sickle cell disease, and all of our research is informed by uh, or inspired by the patients that we take care of. So we have a study for young children with sickle cell disease where we're trying to identify what puts them at risk for brain injury or uh, for cognitive difficulties. And so we are recruiting for that actively, and those children will receive uh, cognitive testing, MRIs, 
uh, as well as a neurological exam. And then we have studies uh, looking at hearing loss and balance issues in children and adults with sickle cell disease. Uh, one part of that study is a survey and another part is where they come in and actually receive hearing and balance testing as part of that study. So we're actively recruiting there as well. And then we have another study for adults with sickle cell disease where we are trying to identify what is a good test that we can use to screen for cognitive issues in adults with sickle cell disease. So those uh, patients would get uh, a cognitive screening test as well as full cognitive testing so that we can identify the best tools to use in clinic uh, to identify those patients that may be higher risk and may require a little bit of a closer look in, in terms of an MRI or additional testing to really figure out what might be going on and impacting them in their daily life and ability to function. We can post information about, about those studies as well on the page for this episode. Thank you to our guests and to you, our listeners. We hope you have found this discussion of sickle cell disease and the brain informative and helpful. Please check out our entire library of topics on your child's brain at wypr.org, kennedykrieger.org, wypr.org slash studios, or wherever you get your podcasts. Your Child's Brain is produced by Kennedy Krieger Institute with assistance from WYPR and producer Spencer Bryant. Please join us next time as we examine the mysteries of your child's brain. <laughs>